Not Your Mother's Radio is listener funded. To contribute and help keep the station going, funds can be sent via PayPal to Elliot. Is. Not. Your. Mother. At. Gmail.com. Remember, there is one Ellen Elliot. Thank you for your assistance. Our special guest tonight is, guitarist, experimental synthesist, sound designer, guitar tech, programmer and tour manager for influential artists like Aldi Miola, Adrian Ballou, Greg Lake, Eddie Jobson, John Wetton, Steve Howe, Keith Emerson, Ike Willis, Don Preston and more. Based in Asheville, North Carolina, Chumley has done demos for Roland and Moog. He plays in Project Object, Zappa Tribute, Wham Bam Bowie Band and Delicious. Try to get on soon. He's just he's an hour to do so. Pepto Bismol to kick it or something. Okay, okay. So, uh, so what do you want to push back the start of it? Or you no, no, we're going. We're going. Okay. Yeah, okay. no, you. Okay. Yeah, great. Okay. I was going to do this solo anyway. It's going to be a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little Okay, everybody, it's Friday night, and um, as promised, Edman will be here shortly, I hope. But in the meantime, we have the one and only Andre Chumley. Now, Andre, your name, your last name's been given to me um, a dozen different ways. You made it simple. What? Yes. What's the real last name? Uh, that is the real last name. <laughs> that's, that's it. Why would it be anything different? Okay. Um, <laughs> no, that's a funny question. We start with a funny question, which is good because it's Zappa night. Um, well, in brief, um, <clears throat> that's it. C H O L M O N D E L E Y. That's the correct spelling. It's a very old name. And you pronounce it Chumley. And the quick reason is I was born in a British colony, British Guyana. Oh, wow. Which became, which became Guyana a year after my birth. And so, Due to the realities of slavery and colonialism, 
everyone uh, of African descent had a name. We, we were named Miller and, right. uh, you know, um, uh, this and that, um, you know, um, Jorgensen, whatever, all these European names. And uh, um, Chumley is like a word like Worcestershire or Leicester. You see a lot of English words in England uh -huh. with all these letters, and it's three syllables. So, so that's kind of the funny thing about it. But okay. uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't mind if people garble it. It's fun. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, we're gonna wait for Ed. We're, we're gonna start, but uh, you know, with any okay. luck, with any luck, Ed's gonna be um, joining us in a bit. But in the meantime, let's yeah. talk about you. You um, have um, a great, great um, history of. Um, I mean, you, you've kind of worked with everybody out there in one form or another. You um, you started out as pretty much a technician in the field. Is that correct? Um, I started out as a musician, which I still am. I, I, so I started the the, the the quick three sentence uh, trajectory would be musician. Got into touring with my band Zappa Band uh, and tour managing for myself, and then translated that over to tour managing for other people. Uh -huh. wow. So that that that's kind of yeah, and, and that's my that's my history in a nutshell. Um, to drill down to that a little bit, um, yeah, started playing guitar kind of late actually. I was uh, right. eighteen or something. Really? And uh, but yeah, yeah, which is really it's funny. Later on, I read about Zappa, and he started around seventeen or eighteen too, which is funny. Um, yeah. And I I'm I'm not you know one tenth as good as he is, but but he caught up fast. But I um so, typical history playing a couple bands in college, blah, blah, blah. Jump ahead to when I formed Project Object, uh, which kind of came out of another band called Zen Pajamas. We used to do a little bit of Zappa at my annual Frank Zappa party. Uh -huh. uh, that that history is well known from people, and it's on my website and stuff. But a few years later, met um, people like Ike Willis, and, uh, or started playing with people like Ike Willis, and it's gone from there, and the list we can get into, but toured with about a dozen Zappa alumni. Yeah. In, two, in 2001, a very important moment, because I, I went out and I was the tour manager for the grandmothers, Don oh, wow. Preston, Don Gardner. Yeah. Um, they actually had Billy Mundy on that one, right. and Roy Estrada, and a wonderful guitarist named Ken Rosser, who's still a good friend and uh, great guitars. So I, I, I went on tour with them and because they knew me pretty well and, um, for a few years and it was the first time I did a tour and I wasn't playing. And it was revelatory for me because I, I'd been tour managing my own band at that point. Oh boy, you know, six years, something, six, seven years. So I knew the ropes, renting the van, booking the hotel, getting flights for those who needed them. Uh, dealing with the money, making a budget, uh, you know, on and on. You know, there's a lot right, of stuff. Right, right. And I just knew it. And so here I was working for someone else and I realized, holy crap, this is awesome because it's like water off a duck's back. This is so normal for me. But I don't have to play. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have to bring my gear in and do all of this stuff and still know how to sing 10 songs. And, and yeah. yeah, so yeah, I was yeah. like, oh, my God, this is so, so that was a big moment. Um, I jumped ahead another four or five years, and uh, through happenstance, I got a gig working for Al Dimiola, the okay. great fusion guitarist. Yeah. So that was my first outside of the Zappa world right. person to work for. And uh, I was very lucky there, too, because Al – Known in the industry as a really tough customer. Right. He's known as a picky guy. He's known as a, a bit of a prickly guy to yeah, some people. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, you know, I love Al and we're, we're friends these days and, you know, it, it ended a little prickly because things <laughs> recent times. But, but you know, Al is one of the most important people in my life too because when you, when you start out with something so difficult, and not, not just him, but just the schedule. And we, we went around the world. We went in my first year on tour with somebody 
to go to Israel and Poland and Chile. Wow. And Al took me all around the country. So it was an incredible boot camp. And from there, it just, it, you know, Adrian Ballou, Greg Lake, ELP, Derek yeah. Trucks, Mo. It just, so I give a lot of credit to Al because he was like university and boot camp rolled into one. Right, right. I actually spoke to Mingo Lewis a couple of weeks ago. Nice. Yeah, and um, I'm sure you know the history you know, with Al and Mingo. Mingo, had, yeah. I think it was in Al's contract that Mingo had to have two songs on every Al album. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. That's great. Well, Cause, Mingo's awesome. Yeah, because originally it was supposed to be Al DiMiola and Mingo Lewis. That's how it was supposed yeah. to have been billed. And, um, you know, Al, you know, I don't know what happened, but Al DiMiola got the, um, you know, got the, you know, the, the album credits. And you spoke to, um, <laughs> and you spoke to Michael Shreve, I know, a good friend well, of mine well, as well. Yeah. And he, he toured with Al in the, um, you know, in, sure. uh, yeah, in the go outfits. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, great, great. And I know, I know what happened. Al happened. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, Al, Al was on fire. But, you know, I didn't know this, but Mingo wrote The Wizard. Yes, that's right. Mingo wrote a bunch of cool stuff, yeah. Yeah. I know. So, yeah. Now, Al is one of those, uh, and again, I love the guy, because I, I try to go with, okay, what's your aggregate result here when you're dealing with any situation? Yeah. And I've had ups, I've had downs with him. But at the end of the day, I recognize his genius. He changed the world. Yeah. You, you can't deny that. I mean, so you have objectivity and you have subjectivity. You cannot deny that the man altered electric kind of fusion, jazz rock, uh, the whole, in fact, we're still living in the shadow of kind of that shredding, yeah. pizzicato, you know, modally based soloing stuff. I mean, because from him you go, certainly he influenced people like Van Halen and Vi, oh, yeah. and Inve, and, and, and so it's quite remarkable. He changed the world. I think one of the sensitive things to know about Al, because I know there's some people out there going, oh my God, he's a jerk. <laughs> I get it, I get it. But one of the things to understand about Al is, and this is not excusing him, but it's just adding reality. Picture being 18, 19 years old, you're, you're the, the best player in the, on the block. You're at Berkeley, you're practicing. And you're just living on ramen or the 1970 equivalent of that. And you're just killing it. The phone rings. And it's Chick Corea yeah. or his people. Yeah. And you're literally this broke kid, you know, 72, whatever year it is. What I love about the internet is somebody's going to write in and say, Andre, it was actually May 13th. You know, yeah, yeah. all right. So some, sometime around then, 72, whatever, he gets this call, Chick Corea. And the point I'm making is he went from living on ramen and shredding at Berkeley to playing in front of 20 and 30,000 people overnight. Yes. And, and, and it hasn't stopped. So, so my point, my, my point from a, like a psychology 101 area is the guy went from n maybe not even learning how to pay rent and take care of yourself and yep. have to pay a bunch of bills and struggle. He went from just being in college, uh, and I'm sure he had some day jobs and stuff, but he went straight from that to biggest star in the world on guitar. Yeah. Um, and again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just saying that makes you pretty crazy. Oh, it does. <laughs> and you know what? Level. I've been talking to a lot of guys like that. I spoke to, um, um, Lenny White, who, you know, worked, you know, you know, sure. you know the story. Um, yeah. And Lenny was um, 16, 17 when he worked on Bitches Brew. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these guys were incredible. Tony Williams. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story before I forget. You, Because I, I know you work with Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Lenny told me a story. Um, and, you know, he, you know, I'm not talking out of school. He told us on, you know, on air that um, when um, Romantic Warrior came out, you know, the Return to Forever um, um, album, um, he was in England, and he was sitting in the living room with Yes and all the guys from Yes and their wives. And um, Steve Howe's wife said to Lenny, it's a great album. It's a beautiful album. How long did it take you to, to record it? And he said, oh, it took us about 11 days. And she said to him, 
You're kidding. 11 days. It takes these guys 11 months to get the snare drum to sound right. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> you, know, you know, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, well, well, yeah, Bruford in his great biography, Bill Bruford, one of my just favorite musicians, composers, players, yeah. uh, he says that he he kind of he, he, you know he left yes pretty quickly at, yeah. after whatever three records, but, but one of his reasons was um, just that sort of thing. He said, "Oh my God, here I am, sitting here in the control room while Chris argues with someone over some little bass sound or some you know yeah." Um, uh, so yeah, yes has has that legend. Um, I, I think they got out of it quite a bit as the years went on, yeah. but. Um, but to segue with Al, let's use Al as a segue point, because, of course, you go to November 1981, and Al Demiola sat in with Frank Zappa, which, of course, yeah. is our central topic. And how excited are we that they're finally going to release those shows um, from, from a couple weeks before that night with Al? They're finally releasing October 31st, 1981. Yeah, well... You saw that, right? Yep, 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 yep. I was actually, uh, that was the Palladium? Yes, the Palladium. Yeah, two I, shows. I was at that show, yeah. Two, two nights, I think, yeah. Yep, yeah. I used to go to uh, the Halloween show every year when I was living in New York. Um, I used to run a club in New York called My Father's Place. Oh, yeah. And Al played there I, a lot. You know? Y yeah, of course. Yeah, I have yeah, yeah, recording, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that's where I met Mingo. That's where I met those guys originally. And, um... You know, he used to live right in that neighborhood, pretty much. He was, you know, right down the road. He lived, right. in, yeah. He lived, uh, you know, in Suffolk County, and um, and you know, we were, you know, we weren't that far from there. So Al used to play the club a lot, and yeah. And the amazing part about Al is, and you can't say this about a lot of guys who who went through the mill at that age. He never, never really got caught up in the um, um, dirty end of the business. You know what I mean? He just kind of kept his nose clean. He did what he had to do, and he kept working, he kept playing, and he kept getting better and better. There was no down, yeah. down, no downside to Al's play, to you know him as a person and him as a musician. You know, that's the bottom line, bro. Um, and this is a constant discussion, especially here we are in the 21st century, where we're in the woke years of our culture. So yeah. there's a lot of, and I always remind people because so there's a lot of analysis. There's a lot of like, well, this person especially with Zappa, and I deal with this a lot, look at these lyrics from 1971. And, and you have to put it in context and say, well, it was 71. It, it, we're not condoning it. We're not saying, yeah. but it was 71. Right. And, 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 and what's the big picture? Is, is, is the, what's the big message? What's the big aesthetic of, of a Frank Zappa? Likewise, Picasso or Miles Davis or uh -huh. Ike, Ike Turner has horrible behavior that, oh, yeah. that's been documented. Do we do we then not acknowledge his absolute, complete, central importance? No, 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 no. You know, not so, just, yeah, not, not just the importance, but he never got involved in. Um, um, I mean, I mean, you know, I don't think he ever abused himself with uh, chemicals or anything. He just. Jimmy Ola, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In that aspect, yeah. Like I said, I was around him for a year. Um, at that point, it was 2006 and seven. Uh, yeah, a glass of wine or something. Like that. But yeah. you're right; you don't hear those stories about him in the no, 70s. No, no, and, I mean, you know, you, uh, know. Uh, you know, I used to, you know, Tommy Bolin would come through the club. Tommy, uh, of course, O'Deed, another great guitar player. Yeah, Roy Buchanan. Yeah. Roy Buchanan used to come through the club. He had yeah. tremendous amounts of problems. Sure. Um, Al used to just, yeah. you know, Al was just a. Um, he he lived to play and he played to live pretty much, and that was his thing. That's it, and, and I, um, yeah, and I'm neither here nor there. The substance abuse stuff is a whole other story. Hey, if people can can maintain and show up at nine o'clock, I'm fine. Um, two, two things you remind me of. Um, yes, Al, and, and, and in, in the year I was with him, I never saw him not practice. I, I tell people that to this day, Elliot. Uh -huh. That's the most amazing. And I've worked with some. Can I curse on the air here? Are, are fuck, we, fuck yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, I've, I've. I'm not bragging, but it's just my history. I've worked with some of the baddest motherfuckers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I sit there and I watch. Um, Adrian Ballou also. He takes his guitar to his room every night. Yep. Adrian's the other guy. I, I don't I don't work on his number one guitar. He takes it to his room and changes strings and writes music and plays. That's yeah. quite remarkable. Because all the other people I, I can name, 
They, they don't take instruments to their rooms. You don't see them on the day off. Al Demiola, we would be in a, an airport uh, at the gate waiting for two hours. Got the guitar. Yeah. A hotel lobby waiting for the van. He's got 20 minutes. Got the guitar. Wow. Backstage. And that's amazing. Uh, that, that's amazing because, uh, yes. I mean, you weren't with him that long ago, if you think about it. You know, in, in the... Um, in the scope, yeah. yeah. Yeah, in the length of time he's been playing. And for for him to still be that dedicated, but look, I mean you're you're a tremendous player. Well, I, thank you. That's, yeah, that's kind. I, I mean you are. I you guys, um, if you're not familiar with Andre's work, I'm going to send. You, I'll spell his name out for you later and everything else. Get on YouTube and check out some of his stuff. I saw you playing um, Manic Depression today on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, and um, yeah, I love that song. Yeah, and I mean you nailed it. And what I like about your style is. You don't copy. Per, I mean, you, you 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 put the important parts into the song, but you find room in the middle there to, to throw your own little uh, autograph in there somewhere. You know, your own little uh, mix. You know what I'm well, saying? Thanks. It's not note for yeah. note. I mean, you know, right. this, you you get the important parts in, but you wail on that thing. I mean, you took a three minute song, turned it into a nine minute opus. You know, and um, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Hen Hendrix Hendrix, of course, is one of my towering. Oh sure. Uh, that's it. He's he's my life. I mean, the guy, uh, and I'm so happy in the 21st century that the family and and Eddie Kramer, who's still with us, is putting out such great, great stuff. Oh yeah. Deep stuff, and not just like money grab kind of bullshit rehearsals or something. No, no. Just really, really good. So, so um, the spirit of Hendrix. When you listen to the live stuff, he always would improvise. You know, he would do these 20 minute yeah. versions. So I love. Man's depression on several levels. Um, just just having a, a, a you know a a, a a six eight kind of a feel or a three four if you prefer. Yeah. Um, having that and, and having that jazz drumming, man, Mitch Mitchell. Yeah. That's a radical song. It is in terms of the feel of it and the sound of the drums and the stops um, and the stops. Yeah, you know, um, and so there's, there's some chromatic weird kind of tonal stuff that that just doesn't. So, so it, it's a great song, and, and of course, I'm probably manic depressed <laughs> part of my life, so it's also a dark humor of singing those words. Uh -huh. um, but Hendrix, uh, I, I, thank you, that, that means a lot, because he's someone who... And, and, and Eddie Cremo uh, yeah. is, is a genius. Oh, come on. I think, um, I mean, I, I think half of um, Hendrix's credit should have been given to Kramer. Um, well, he gets a lot these days, especially with, the, yes, the production... Yeah. Um, yeah. You know what's funny is you bring up my father's place, and uh -huh. you're not going to believe this. Well, you will, because my life is crazy. Exactly one year ago today, which is the 21st, I'm going to say uh, we were we were just arriving or leaving. I was on tour one year ago, myself and Robin, my partner, who is also part of my music production uh -huh. company, Guitar Tour Productions. We were working for 10 years after, one year ago. Oh, wow. And, yeah, and we, we played at my father's place, oh. I'm going to say August 22nd last oh. year. I think it was 22nd, yeah. So yeah. that was, yeah. yeah. That's the new my father's place. It's the, the new, new one, right. Yeah. But the, what's the guy's name who runs Epi. it? He's still there. Epi, Epi. Epi, yeah, yeah. 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 So he was there and, you know. Um, so, But that, that's another one I, I didn't think of when we kind of jumped around the list there. I... I'm so fortunate and and I hate using the word blessed because oh, so now um, I'm, I'm an atheist, but but um, I, I'm I feel blessed because I work with some people as diverse as um, ten years after, you know, which right. is amazing. Those guys how are, are they? Great. How yeah. are they now that uh, Alvin Lee's gone? You know, they're great, and I urge people to go check them out because yes, yeah, is that his son in the band? No, so okay. so there's there's two original guys. Okay, Rick Lee, the yeah. drummer, uh -huh. who's no relation, right. but he spent 50 years telling people that. So Rick Lee on drums and Chick Churchill on keys. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, so those two guys, if you watch the Woodstock videos, there yeah. they are. Yeah, the yeah, drummer yeah. the keyboard player. Alvin Lee has died, of course. Yeah. The bass player, the bass player is a really amazing guy named um, uh, Colin Hodgkinson. Oh, he's been around for a long time. Yes, 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 and 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 he is someone that also uh, the kind of Zappa fans who love details listening to this. 
check out Colin Hutchinson because he played with Alexis Corner. Yeah. He played with um White Snake. He's on the he's on the White Snake. Wait a second. Um, Wait, whoa, 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 hold on. Listen to this one. You know who I spoke yeah. to more than once? He's became a good friend of mine. Zoot Money. Oh God, yeah. Now Col Colin used to work for Zoot. That's right. Yeah. He worked for all those English blues guys, yeah, uh, Paul yeah. Butterfield. Um, he was with Zoot Money, exactly. Um, but, but then he's on, he's on White Snake Slide It In. Oh, uh-huh, wow. <laughs> Out of all which I was nominated for the most subtle rock title of all time. Slide, yeah, slide It In. Slide It In, yeah. Um, but, but, but the one more band I'll mention from him, he was in this band called Backdoor. Okay. Which, which, what an unsung band. Do you know Backdoor? Yeah, I don't. I don't know the band. Yeah. No, I don't. I never heard of that band. Yeah, people should check out Backdoor, man. They were early seventies, and they did a I don't know five or six albums, and they were kind of like jazz fusion with like a little world thing, a little Latin thing going on. Yeah, yeah, well. And and if you looked them up, people like Tony Levin, Alfonso Johnson, all these seventies bass players, they they look up to this guy, Colin Hodgkinson. Yeah, because he did. Yeah, and so then he did a few things. Like the Schoen and Hammer album, uh, you know, um, Jan Hammer with, yeah, yeah. with Neil Schoen. He did those. He did a bunch of Jan Hammer. So he's this heavy cat, man. John Lord. He played with all these people. So he's in 10 years after now. And then, um, uh, finally the guitarist is a guy named Marcus Bonfanti. Uh-huh. He's the young cat. He's, I don't know, 30, 30, 33 years old. Right. So that, that's 10 years after today. And they're, well, they're great. Well, um, I mean, I'm I'm older than you, uh, uh, and um, I saw the original ten years after at sure. headline uh, Madison Square Garden, and oh wow, uh, the opening act was Buddy Miles. Wow, yeah, that was uh, seventy, I guess, probably nineteen seventy. And uh, I can smell the weed. Yeah, I can too. Um, in fact, I'm wearing that same shirt. No, I'm just fooling. <laughs> <laughs> But it you know, hasn't been washed in. Yeah, I'm looking up. I'm looking up back door now. Tony Hicks was in that band too. Another incredible, right. a great, incredible drummer. I'm, I'm, I'm urging people. If you're listening to this, if you're crazy enough to be listening, and you like '70s music, you like jazz rock, you like fusion, you gotta go watch some videos too. There's some great. There's a TV sh- shot video that's very high high quality. And um, but Colin Hopkinson, yeah, he's. What a sweetheart of a guy too, and uh, like like all those English guys I tour with, yeah, great stories, great stories. Oh man. yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they do. And um, um, <laughs> yeah, Tony Hicks, Tony Hicks is is a, is a killer drummer. He's he's incredible. Um, so good, yeah, so good. So, um, wow. Now, if I'm not wrong, towards the end of his career, Alvin Lee was playing bass in that band, right? And that young guy was the lead guitarist. I I, di- I didn't know that. I don't know. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so uh, let's see. I, I guess so. Anyway, Zappa. I, want, I just wanted to say again. I'm just in a real extra Zappa mood because uh-huh. uh, a I'm excited about that 1981 concert. That's one of my oh, absolute yeah. favorite eras of Zappa. Um, and and I'm also been listening to a lot of the reissue of Orchestral Favorites. Have you heard that? Yeah, um, you know, I have. I had the original vinyl. I've been a Zappa oh, fan for a thousand years, but that that reissue is great. It's incredible. It you is. Know. It really um, is. Uh, you know what? It sounds like a different album. It's not even close to the original release. Yeah, the rest of it, right? Yeah, it starts out with it, like many of those reissues do. It starts yeah, yeah, out with yeah. um, you know the old record, and then they go into. But the stuff that's extra, the stuff that's, yeah, that's unheard, great. is. I don't know if you I know can't this. listen. I don't know if you know this, but I used to work with Flo and Eddie. I did. Yeah, um, back at my father's place, the old club, um, uh, Epi and um, a guy named Smitty Warren Smith um, owned a record label called Epiphany Records. It was part of the whole of my father's place world. It was a reggae al- a reggae label, and um, we okay. sent Mark and Howard to Jamaica. They did a reggae album for us called Rock Steady with Flo and Eddie. It was uh, the, wow. the Whalers and Augustus Pablo were on that album, and it's um, wow. Yeah, it's a great, great album. Yeah, so I go back to Zappa's it. people for a, a long, long time. Um, I saw Zappa the first time. Blah, 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 blah. It must have been sixty nine at the Fillmore. Wow, 
And wow, then, yeah. And I saw the 70s shows. Um, I, and um, I saw the um, uh, um, uh, Carnegie Hall shows as well. And, um, you know, then I saw him, you know, at the Palladium and all that other stuff. So I saw a couple of um, different Zappa bands. But um, I don't know if you know what I'm doing now. In fact, um, before, I spoke I don't. To, before I spoke to you today, I spoke to um, Tom Fowler. Tom's going to be on the show Sunday night. Um, oh, t- yeah. tell my brother Tom I said hi. I, of I did. I told him I can't talk all night because I had to come talk to you. So he sends his regards. He sends his love, and he wants to do the show with you one night. Um, anyway, um, last week I spoke to Scott Tunis. Love him. Another yeah, bass player. I spoke to Ray White, who's who's yeah, a, who's a, ma- a madman. He just yes, and just just recovered from COVID. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I spoke to Ray. Um, Ian Underwood's coming on the show. Love him, but don't know him. That's yeah, one of the um, few kind I, of. I spoke. No. To, I spoke to Bon Bunk and Don. My uh, brothers. Yeah, uh, I'm in love with Bunk Gardner and his wife. Oh, he's the best. Yeah. Here's something to here's something to ask Bunk, and, and it, it's a you know he's he, he's proud of this, but he not many people know this story, but it's public. He, you know who Rusty Anderson is? Oh yeah. Wait, from from um, from Paul McCartney's band. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. He, so he's a long time guitarist from Paul McCartney. God, it's got to be 20, 20, 25 years. So he lives a, a couple blocks from Bob Gardner in in L.A. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they're pals, and they get together every so often. Obviously, not in some time now. And they get together and jam, and they do like space music together. Wow. Isn't that the most, you know, unlikely yeah. thing you've ever heard of? Wow, it's incredible. So ask, ask, Bunk, ask Bunk about that, because you would never think that he's good friends with, you know. Yeah. Well, not that you would never think that. Well, but Bunk's going to be on with me again next okay. week. Me and him are doing a morning thing off air, just a, just a podcast awesome. thing. I love Bunk. He's awesome. the greatest guy in the world. He's, he, he's the best. And I, love, uh, and I love when him and Don are on together. It's like a, a, an old married couple. It's the funniest yeah. thing. It's the funniest thing. It's like they correct each other. They finish each other's sentences. The, yep. the two of them are great. They're incredible guys. And then, of course, well, Ed, Ed Mann's been on, and I'm really upset that he's sick tonight. I, you know, I hope he gets well and calls in soon. But um, We wish him well. We yeah, wish him Ed, well. Ed's, Ed, Ed kind of talked me into doing this. He said to me, look, you, you're a Zappa lover. and you know, I, I see that, and um, I want you to do me a favor. I did this whole thing for Ed. And then when we started talking about people to invite on the show, he said to me, you've got to get Andre on. He said, Andre never worked with Frank, but um, he gets it. He knows what it's about. And um, he's the only um, outside of the mother's family, the Zappa family, you know, mu- musician-wise, that um, he really thinks gets the whole Zappa thing. He's not in it just as um, kind of like just to do it because it's Zappa, but he feels he feels it. He, he kind of relates to it, and he is a real lover of Zappa music. And um, that's, you know, and I would have loved to have gotten you on anyway, but Ed kind of waved the flag and said, make sure you talk to Andre if you're talking to all the Zappa people. Well, that, that's, I, I'm, that, that, that's, I'm overcome with emotion. That, that's one of the, um, uh, the kindest and most powerful um, endorsements you can get, certainly. But yeah. But just a very wonderful um, for Ed to say that, and then he did. He reached out to me and said, "Man, and likewise, he said you got to get a, this guy Elliot to check his show out. He's great. He does." But and, and he said, "You know, he said I told him he needs to bring you in," and I, I, I do appreciate that because um, Ed, in turn, let's remember he is. I mean, we can get down and count the days and the weeks, yeah. but he is. It's either him or Ike Willis for being well, both of them are the longest-running Zappa members of all time. Right. And people need to appreciate that. Ed started out with, of course, overdubbing in uh, either late 76 or whatever, or right mm-hmm. around there. Yeah. Late, late 76, to overdub the Zappa New York stuff. And, of course, he told me a story recently where he met Zappa at the Royce Hall shows, the right. ones we just talked about, or Catch Your Favorites. But, but Ed goes from 76, straight up, of course, he's in the 78 band, he's, you know, on... Yeah. Shake your all that. 81 band. And then he's not there in the smaller band, 84, but he's on all the records yeah, throughout yeah, that yeah. period. And then he's, of course, on the final. So Ed, and then he was the, 
the vault meister and all that. So, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. um, the um, the, the clone meister. Yeah, sorry. clone meister. Yeah. So, so so Ed has a really unique perch in terms of um, you know, and and this is all stuff I would say if he was sitting here on the phone. So I hope he comes on to. Yeah. But but the other thing about Ed is that. And it's very unique in, in kind of musicians of his training. It's very unique in guys and gals who have that, they, they've been to school, they can read, they understand jazz, classical, they understand, you know, they, they've studied orchestral music, they've studied harmony, they, they understand deeply what's happening mechanically. But one of the things that Ed has that most of the, the people I just said don't, is he's into world music and Indonesian music and yeah. he's into and then he's into the whole area of meditation and working with gongs, working mm-hmm. with pure sound, working with synthesizers, understanding what sonics are, understanding right. tonalities and that, that that's where it turns the corner because then that's where you get and and of course Frank Zappa we're talking about in the meta sense. Frank got that. That's why Frank was like this guy right here because I can hand him anything to read and he'll read it. So that's job one. But job two, I can tell him, you know, improvise the sound of a duck flying into a, a, a airplane uh, propeller and being sliced into 17 pieces. Ed will go, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so, you know, yep. that's, I just made up a stupid example, but yeah, yeah. the point being, uh, 90% of kind of that trained world musician, it can't improvise. You know, I work with yeah. people that are orchestral trained and many of them can, especially in the modern era. But so Ed, Ed, Ed brings together all this stuff um, did that it, I think... Did Ed tell you about his audition with uh, Zappa? Yeah, sure, sure. I've heard that story a couple of times. Yeah, he told you about the and, guitar? He played, um, he played the Jimi Hendrix uh, Monterey guitar. Oh, I didn't know. I don't remember hearing that. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He saw it sitting there, and he said to Frank, "Do you mind if I uh, pick it up?" I don't remember hearing that. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I, I remember him just talking about how fast it went and how you know he just well he had known Frank a bit before that. Yeah, yeah. As, he, as a fan, you know, just going up and, and, and meeting him at uh, again Royce Hall. Yeah. Um, but um, one of the other things I was going to ask Ed about, and, and again, hopefully we will in twenty minutes is this release, of course, this um, Halloween 81, because one of the things about that band, um, and I, I, that's one of my favorite lineups, because right. it's a pinnacle for Frank, because you've got just about everyone on stage reads, right. so he, he was able to do those ridiculous pieces like Maggio and, and, and um, Alien Orifice, yeah. which, is, Black which nap- is... Black Napkins. But that is, which, which isn't a hard song per se. I mean, Frank's doing all the heavy lifting. It's only two chords. But, um, but you mean Black Page, maybe? Uh, Black uh, Page, that's what I meant. Black, Black Page, Page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Black Back is, yeah, two, two beautiful chords. Um, but, um, you know, uh, he was able to, to put that, you know, sinister footwear came out of that band, you know. Right, um, right, yep. So, so he was able to do this ridiculous level of stuff. But again, it's that balance. Because there's tons of people who could play that shit, you know, um, yeah. with enough with enough work. But can you be as funny as Bobby Martin in, in a Flash outfit? Can you can you pull off the humorous voices that Tommy Mars did? Can can you can you hold it down with a wry sense of humor like Scott Tunis, who people don't realize how funny Scott is. You know, oh my God. So I got to tell you a looking. Scott story before you, when you're done. <laughs> sure. Sure. But, 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 but to just say again, that the other pinnacle of that era, and I could, I, I don't have to, I can go down each band member just at the, at a mind blowing level in their playing, Chad, Levi, Ray White sounding incredible, yeah. singing all night, playing great blues guitar, playing all that rhythm stuff, you know, everyone perfect in their place. But the other thing is, in, by 1981, Frank had, over the past four or five years at that point, had taken guitar technology into the stratosphere. I mean, I, I'm so happy this guy, Nick Evers, has this, this, this book, um, Zappa Gear. Uh-huh. You familiar with that? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. You should get him on the show. But, but, but people that, that they're into the technical side, and, and I'm a guitar tech, so I'm always thinking about this stuff and studying it. What Frank came up with, with the help of like Midget Slotman and a lot of other, you know, technical people in LA and stuff. By the mid seventies, he was doing stuff on stage that would not be around for another six years. Like, like the kind of modulation control and right. the kind of the, the, the studio quality rack mount equipment that he was bringing on stage. Uh, when other people just had, yeah, kind of these effects pedals that were neat, but they were noisy and they, they failed a lot. Right, right. Uh, if, if this is too technical for anyone. No, uh, no, no, just, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm saying it, it might be. Let's, there, someone may, might hear this at some point and, and it's going over the head. And I'm just going to offer to them, just go put on Shut Up and Play Your Guitar. And just listen to the tonality, listen to the quality of the sound, listen to the guitar, listen to the phasing, the flanging, the kind of spatial, uh, you know, timbre of the guitar. Right. And, 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 and tell your, and, and understand that these are things recorded in 77, 78, 79, and 80. It is fucking science fiction. It really is. I mean, it, so by 81, you get 81 Halloween, he has got some of the most... So I love listening to those shows, and I cannot wait for this high-quality release of everything. Because um, uh, if, if, as a reference point, if anyone wants to just go to YouTube and, and pull up Alien Orifice, the, the song Alien Orifice, just punch in 1981 Halloween. I don't know, man. That That's... For me personally, that's one of the greatest seven or eight minutes in Western culture. <laughs> I'm going to go that far. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Because it, it, it's all there. It's all there. And I was going to bring this up with Ed because the shit that Ed is doing. I know. In Alien Orifice. I know. Did you, and you know what? He, <laughs> he, he, must run, he must put three miles on running up and back. Uh, you know, everybody. Every, every, yeah. There's not a person on the stage that's not at the edge of ability on some of that stuff, the, the polyrhythms, yeah. the, the through composed stuff that never repeats. The, and then, and then, Frank Zappa picks up a guitar and it, it's one of the greatest solos. Right. And everything I just said is in that solo. It's, there's this beautiful slow phasing thing on the guitar. It's an incredible Les Paul. He's playing it through probably three or four incredible amps. Wow, man, yeah. that that's the shit for me. Um, His bands kept getting more and more um, proficient. He, they kept getting more and more, uh, um, you know, the level of playing just kept higher and higher and higher. And, um, I mean, guys like Scott, uh, incredible, incredible players. Um, you know, Ed, Ed, Ed's a monster. And um, I don't know if he realizes what he um, added to, the, to that band, but... Um, First of all, he was a great player. He was a great showman. And, um, yeah. you know, Chad was great. Uh, uh, um, Tommy Mars was great. It was just incredible times for Frank. It, 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 it actually was. And it's funny. I dug up an old modern drummer. I was telling Ed this on a message a, a month or two ago. I have a, 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 I'm a frustrated drummer, by the way. And, and uh -huh. in a funny way, uh, Zappa, as a hero, it's funny to find that out that he was a drummer. But I played drums, and I, I could probably, you know, I could probably gig in, the, like, a simple rock band at this point. Right. But I play drums, uh, and I play a lot of hand percussion and electronic percussion and stuff. So, um, so I buy magazines, like Modern Drummer and, you know, Modern Percussionist and stuff, and I, you know, I, I read all kinds of things, keyboard magazines. So I was reading this um, interview with Ed Mann, 1982, in Modern Drummer, a feature story. And it's remarkable how some of the stuff he says, the philosophical stuff about music uh -huh. and about studying, um, it's amazing how um, spot on it was, you know, almost 40 years ago, and how consistent Ed's vision has been on that. Because one of the things he said that really stuck with me is he's talked about his studying. He talks about being done with college and then studying with a bunch of different percussionists right. in, in L.A., and he, in California, and he, he says he started learning other 
instrument, you know, not only the drum set, but just starting to work on other types of percussion and other percussion instruments and, and of course, piano and stuff like that. But he, he just made it clear that how each type of instrument just strengthens the other ones because you're, you're learning a whole other approach, again, to, to tonality and timbre and stuff. So, um, you know, the other, the other component for Ed, too, we've, we've discussed kind of his, he's got that classical training, you right. know, the, the orchestral is a better word. And he understands deep jazz fan. I mean, he played, right. played a lot of jazz. And, and of course, all of Western music. He's a pop fan, he's a reggae fan, et cetera. And then, as I said, the, the, the kind of gongs and meditative ambient music. He did a lot of records with that repercussion unit and, yeah. he, you know. But the other area that a lot of people don't talk about is that Ed um, g- grew up loving Stockhausen and, and Verace and right, right. You know, same John people, Cage. Yep, and yep. Same Stavinsky. people. Yep. Same people. Frank. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Frank, Frank. Yep. Yeah. And I'm always talking to Zappa fans, you know, because I, I get a lot of Zappa fans, of course, asking me questions for 25 years, which I love. It's one of the most beautiful things in my life. Right. I'm honored that, that these younger people come up to me and say, you know, which album should I buy? Or what was Frank using on this song? And sometimes we get into conversations about how did Frank Zappa come up with his, his style? And I'm always urging them. Well, first off, no one can really answer that. But I always urge people, you have to be a diverse listener. You right, can't right. just listen to prog rock. You, you, you know, it, it, no, you can do whatever the hell you want. But if you want to be a composer, if you want to be, you know, so I, I meet these people who are frustrated that, that this isn't happening, that's happening. And then I kind of interrogate them on what they're into. And I say, well, your problem is all you're listening to is the same type of music. Right. You gotta, you know, you gotta go listen. And I try to explain to them that that's the key to a Prince or a Zappa or a Todd Rundgren or a Miles Davis or any of these people who you can name with one name, they all kind of did different music along the way and they absorbed different music. Yeah. And so that, that's a, that's a key Zappa thing for me that people, they, they don't realize that the doo-wop was just as important to him as the Johnny Guitar Watson and the Verace. And they were all equally as important to him as, you know, synthesizers and, and, and all right, the other right, stuff. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, it's true. I mean, and you know what else? Um, uh, Zappa wasn't afraid to have um, an interracial band when, um, you know, w- when it wasn't cool, you know? He, Absolutely. He, yeah. He's, he's in, he can count on one hand uh, Santana, Sly and the Family Stone. Yep. Um, Maybe Tower, one or Tower two other. Power, you know, Tower of Power. And it's all the good bands. Miles Davis, yeah, but, but in rock, yeah. it, it was, it was much more common in jazz, of course. Yeah, 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 but I'm just saying those were the bands that, uh, but in rock, had, had longevity. Yeah. You know, uh, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, he got all the flavors in there. He got all, you know, he, he, he made a soup out of it. And, that's uh, right. And it worked that's great. Right. I mean, I, 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 right. I spoke to Ike years and years ago. Me and Ike were kind of friendly. And, yeah. um, you know, he, um, you know, he, uh, George Duke, another great, great player that didn't Amazing. belong, that you would never think would wind up working with Frank Zappa, you know, from the jazz, uh, uh field. Um, right. You know, uh, you know, um, sort of, yeah, yeah. You know, Ray White. Have you heard Ray's new album? Not the new one, no. Yeah, I, he, no. He, it's a I sl- gotta... he did a slow jam album. It's great. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's really, gr- it's really nice. Um, I picked up a copy the other day. Um, but, but look, but look at the diversity he had. You know, I mean, Jean-Luc Ponte for a while, you know, the whole thing, uh, Sugarcane Harris. He, um, he wasn't afraid to mix it up. You know, he wasn't afraid to bring in different, um, you know, things that wouldn't make sense in, you know, when you think of the mothers of invention. But that's why it had to become the Zappa band. You know, it had to become something different. No, you're right. Um, it's, um, uh, well, you, 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 you remind me too of, um, uh, we're just talking about racial, um, diversity in the band. Yeah. Our, our, our dear friend that we just mentioned, Michael Shreve. Yeah. That's the, being in Santana. When I interviewed him, um, recently, that was the topic. Um, you know, the, um, 
the, how different that was at that time. And that was even more integrated than just quote unquote black and white. Oh, Latino yeah. also. You had oh, yeah, guys yeah, from Mexico. Yeah. You had guys. Um, and by the way, just to, I, I, I always forget to plug my other stuff. I, I'm now doing, I'm returning actually to my mid eighties, uh, vocation. I was, I was starting to be a journalist in the mid eighties. I was writing for two college papers at Rutgers University. Really? I interviewed, yeah, I interviewed Gil Scott Heron in 1985 for, for a cover story for the Livingston Medium in, in, uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh -huh. and, and, and I did a lot of reviews and, and interviews and stuff for about 10 years. I wrote for a couple of magazines. I wrote oh. for two newspapers in New Jersey. Um, the Hub and the Two Ever Times. So I was really down that road, you know, um, yeah. and then I, did other stuff anyway yeah jump the coronavirus i'm going back to that and i'm doing i have an interview series called the guitar tour interview series yep. guitar tour people should know is my name if you look on social media i am at guitar tour just like it sounds the word guitar t-o-u-r so at guitar tour on twitter at guitar tour on instagram guitar tour.net and then my my series is called the guitar tour interview series so you can go to my uh, any of those places and you can figure it out. But my website, you can just punch in my name, also com. But I interviewed Michael Shreve. That's up there. Yeah. I just completed an interview with the great Steve Hunter, who wow. played with Alice, Mitch Ryder and yeah, Alice yeah, Cooper, Alice Cooper. Lou, Lou Reed. Lou Reed. I saw he, that. On, I, I saw that show at the Academy of Music, the um, oh, Rock and Roll Animal Tour. Rock and Roll Animal, sure. Yeah. So, uh, so I interviewed Steve Hunter. I, I just interviewed Adam Holtzman. The great keyboard player from yeah. Miles Davis and Stephen yeah. Wilson. I've got an interview in the can with Les Fradkin, the MIDI guitar pioneer. Wow. And I also just wrapped one with Pat Mastelato, of course, from oh, yeah. Crimson, Crimson. Mr. Mr. XTC. Yeah. So that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm doing interviews in part. That's what I'm doing. And all four of those are going to be up in the next two weeks or so. Yeah. So, so people that are interested in that kind of stuff. Uh, get on my Twitter feed or and um you know. and do me a favor, send me a, um the link and I'll make sure people know about it when I do the shows. I will. But you listen to this. You think you're I will. You think you got some winners? Listen to this. I spoke to Pat, uh -huh. I spoke to Patrick Leeson. Oh, great, a good yeah. friend of mine. Yeah, I'm, do, I'm, do, I'm doing Pat again next week. Um, Sam Morrison is coming on next week. Oh, brilliant! And um 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 um, um I um um um. um, um Lawrence Juba was on. From, you know, we were talking about McCartney earlier. Sure. And uh, Peter White's been on. Peter's going to be doing a DJ set with me next week. And um, it's really, you know, it's amazing that um, I hate talking about this virus with any type of positivity to it. But, um, sure. um, uh, you know, I feel, you know, uh, remorse for everybody who got hit hard with this. But I think it brought out um, talents that people didn't know they had. Uh, uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I started this show, uh, uh, I think, 10 weeks ago, and uh, I spoke to some of the greatest people. Um, you know, I, I, you're on with me. I never would have um, had the, uh, you know, the inkling, the, the idea to give people like you or Ed Acol or, or, you know, Ray White. Like, I spoke to Scott Tunis last, you know, last week. Scott scared the crap out of me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I, I He's funny. He's, yeah, I spoke to Ray. I spoke to Ray before I spoke to Scott, and I said, "Man, this guy scares me." And he says, "Just remember <laughs> one thing: Scott's is all is just it's, it's all it's all it's all noise." He said, "He's a sweetheart deep down." So I got him on the line. I said, "Hey, Scott, I know." Um, I said, "You're supposed to be a tough guy, and uh, I could be tough too." So let's have some fun tonight. We laughed the whole night. He, he turned into such a sweetheart. It was incredible. Well, that's it. That's yeah. it. And, and, yeah. and I, could, I could easily make this show, you know, um, 60 questions for how Andre loves the Zappa alumni. I love these guys. You know, yeah. I, as a little Zappa fan, at, I became a Zappa fan at 16, but I saw them live in, when I was 19, 84. But um, it, it's, it's a joy. It's, 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 a, it's a dream. It's one of those things where you, you wouldn't even think you would meet these rock stars yeah. and to have met these guys to have played the first guys i met were 1984 i went to see zappa um my first time was in, in jersey somewhere the art center a couple nights later and this is august uh 84 and a couple days later they, they were out in um long island at the at the um 
What's that? Col- not the Coliseum. What's the outdoor one in Long Island? Um, Jones Beach, right? Yeah, yeah, the amphitheater. Yeah, Jones Beach. Jones Beach. Yeah. And I kind of, and when I think back, I was 19. I had never driven out to Long Island. I, and this is, you know, no GPS on your phone, any yeah, of that yeah, shit. Yeah. And somehow, I could picture it now. I could picture, like, the wrong exit and the turning around and the panicking. Yep. But I made it. I got out there. And I was early enough that I was milling around, as fans do, and, you know, people are having a beer and, you know. And I was over by the merch. You know, it, it's two hours before the show or something. Yeah. And and I turn around, and it's a crowd of people. And there's Scott Tunis, Bobby Martin, and Ray. Wow. And they had just kind of come out in the audience to just hang around. And they weren't really being bugged. You know, there's maybe two people talking to them. Yeah. And, and I'll never forget that. I could picture it crystal clear. And so I went over and I, just in awe. And I said, oh, my God, you know, so I met these guys. So it's, it's, it's a special thing in my life that I can jump ahead uh, and, and by about 20 years from then. Um, well, I've never performed with Scott, and I hope to someday. Yeah. But about by about twenty years later, I had I had toured with Ray White several times, and I had played live with Robert Martin uh-huh. three or four times. You know, that, by then, you know, um, right. we've also never toured, but we've played a bunch in, in Tapanali. Well, well, yeah, let me tell you what my end game is here. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm talking to all the Zappa guys and the mothers and um, you, and um, in another couple of weeks, it may take a little longer. I plan on doing a big Zoom thing with everybody who I've spoken to. Great. And I'd love to have you. I'm inviting you. I'd love to have you do it with us when we do it. I'd be honored. And, um, you know, everybody said, okay, at first, um, um, uh, you know, I didn't know if Scott would be able to do it, but he uh, said, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to miss this. Um, every, yeah. Everybody's in. Uh, I spoke to Sal, Sal Marquez. He, um, yeah. He's going to do it. Um, everybody's in. Everybody's in. The um, uh, uh, Don's in. Don Preston, Bunk Gardner's in. Everybody wants to do it. I spoke to Tom That'll Fowler be epic, about bro. it. Yeah, uh, epic, epic. Yeah, Robert Martin. I'm talking to next week. You know, one to one like this, and then I'm, yeah. I'm going to invite him on, and um, you know, Ian Underwood, and everybody knows sure. about it. So, um, well, I I, I'm 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 honored to be yeah. to be invited to kind of be a fly on the wall and, and, and check well, that out. And you know what would even be better than that? I mean, I don't have the, um, um, the, the the toolbox to get this pulled off. I would love to have some, you guys maybe, you know, all do some kind of a jam or something. I don't know if it's possible. Well, well uh, it, it's nigh on impossible, bro. In 2020, the technology still isn't there. And here's why. And it could be solved. We could snap our fingers and get North Korea. Uh, I'm sorry, North Korea. No, South Korea technology. Uh-huh. Do you know that South Korea has the fastest internet in the world i know we don't yeah well you know we we, we also don't have comprehensive universal health care they've yeah, got I know, that i know I they've know. got bullet trains everywhere they've got 14 years of state-sponsored education yep. they've got low crime blah 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 um we can go on about that but um but 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 um and, and, and the scandinavian countries japan a number of other countries um actually japan's a mixed bag on on internet well, a lot of countries have uh, the, this uh, internet that's several years ahead of ours. So that's the first problem, is that if, if all those people live in the United States, you're going to have varying throttled, you know, kind of internet speed. And it just there's just no way to play music because you've got, you know, even if it's down to 8 or 10 milliseconds delay, know, even if it's 5. I know, I know. I know. You've got, um, you got some issues. Um Having said that, if we if we did like a big ambient space jam, like Civilization Phase Three, uh-huh. and there was no tempo, <laughs> yeah, 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 and that that would work. That would work. Um, can I tell a Scott story? Yeah. So so Scott, uh, uh, who I, I love that man. He's uh, just a funny guy, and, and one of those people exactly that people are scared of. And I, I probably he's probably going stop it. I keep them scared of me. They'll leave me the fuck alone. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I, that's maybe something Scott would say. But, but Scott, um, I, I, as I said, I met him in, in 84, and then, and then again in 88. Not Your Mother's Radio is listener-funded. If you wish to assist and help keep the station active, funds can be sent via PayPal to Elliot. Is. Not. Your. 
mother at gmail.com. Remember, there is one Ellen Elliot. Thank you for your assistance. It is appreciated. This is the end of part one. Please continue to part two.